Um, uh, Dr. Alicia Wolberg is going to be speaking to us about fibrinogen through the eyes of a researcher. Um, she is the professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So we're going to open up um, the viewing for Dr. Wolberg and um, we will have questions following. So um, we're ready to go. Thank you, All right. Eileen. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. I'm going to, um, let's see. Perfect. First in the chat, I'm going to put a link to an article that we published about a year ago that talks about fibrinogen. And it includes a lot of images that I'm going to be showing in my presentation. So feel free to click on that afterwards or see if that um, is a useful tool. And if I can interrupt, we also did send a copy of that article to everyone in our registration toolbox. Great, wonderful. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and now let me get the shared screen function. And uh, beautiful. Is it it's sharing the full screen? Okay, great. Beautiful. Now this is going to work. So, um, so first, good morning, um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this. It's a really momentous event that, um, that uh, you've put together and, and I'm learning a lot and, and really sort of enjoying listening and being a part of this. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and hear what's going on. Um, what I'm going to do is present um, a, a little bit different of a spin. I'm going to actually, in listening to the, the two previous presentations, um, Dr. Manka Johnson and Dr. Acharya, I'm going to talk about a lot of the same kinds of things, but from maybe a different perspective. Um, and it's going to be a very visual presentation, which I hope will make it a little bit different. Um, it's, so you'll enjoy hearing, even if some of the things overlap a bit. The first thing I wanted to do was just explain how I got here because I'm not a physician. So that makes me a little bit unique in this field. Um, I've had a long career of almost 30 years in blood coagula coagulation research. And so I thought I'd just uh, spend one slide telling you how I got to where I am today and that I'm sitting here with you. Um, I am a, a Tar Heel um, and I've done most of my training in Chapel Hill, which has been historically a center of, of blood clotting research for um, many years, even before I was born. I got my college degree there and then got my PhD uh, training there. And, and that's where I began my sort of lifelong career long passion for blood research. Um, from there, I spent a short amount of time at Duke University, which is interesting if you're a Tar Heel, we are arch rivals in sports. Um, but after that, I returned to uh, a faculty position at UNC where I um, am now a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And the things that I do are, include research into blood clotting and I teach. I teach other people how to do research and I teach people about blood clotting disorders and I really am passionate about those things. My path to fibrinogen is um, involved a few short stops along the way. I started studying factor nine when I was in graduate school, the protein that's responsible for um, hemophilia B. And that's, that's what ignited my fascination with blood clotting. I moved up the cascade a little bit to understand how clots get started in the first place. And tissue factor is a protein that Dr. Micah Johnson mentioned. And right around that same time, I got involved in a project to look at fibrinogen. And this really is um, where my interest has been ever since. And we've incorporated other things into our studies, but everything in my lab in some way connects to fibrinogen and how it's functioning um, because it's, it's truly, um, it truly is my favorite molecule. So um, I'm gonna spend one slide here telling you the different ways that we approach thinking about fibrinogen. Um, this is our cartoon of fibrinogen. It's the same one that Dr. Micah Johnson showed from a review we published a few years ago. First, we look at blood and how this protein functions in blood. Um, we also talk with patients and we look at population studies to try to understand um, both how it functions in an individual person, but also how, what things it has in common across a number of people so that we can ensure that our, the research that we do can apply to a lot of people. We leverage the idea that, um, as you heard this morning, um, fibrinogen has evolved in, in a host of disorders, including bleeding disorders and clotting disorders, thrombotic disorders. And the balance of those two actually can be very helpful for us understanding its function um, using sort of the yin and yang of, of that protein to understand what it's doing. 
And then to do these studies, we use a number of models. Some of them are very creative. Um, we have colleagues that have fish that don't have fibrinogen and mice that don't have fibrinogen. And that enables us to study things um, in, a, in a good fashion so that we can understand what's going on. And surprisingly, those um, those settings very much uh, tell us a lot about what's going on in humans. And then I'm, as a sort of trained biochemist, spend a lot of time just looking at fibrinogen and looking under the microscope. Um, and, and that's actually what I'm going to show a lot of images today. And that really is because I'm a very visual person. And I think that helps tell the story quite well. What I'm going to do first is kind of describe what we know and do this in a visual format. And then I'm gonna just give one example of how we figure out what we don't know. Um, and that's what we're always open to and that's what we're trying to do in research. All right, so this is an image that actually comes out of that review um, that you'll have in your toolkit and that I gave the link to. Um, first to highlight why fibrinogen is factor one. Um, and I didn't know if this would be something that is considered common knowledge or not, but I tell all the students that come into my lab this. Um, the, all the clotting factors are named by Roman numerals, and they're named in the order in which they were discovered. And so that makes fibrinogen, gives fibrinogen a special place in history. It was the first clotting protein that was ever described. And it was described in the 1600s, um, around the same time of the Great Fire of London, England and Netherlands were at war. There was a lot going on. I wonder if all the bleeding from the war helped, um, helped uh, uh, sort of ignite this field of discovery. And the reason it was discovered first, I think, is because of all the clotting factors. It's the one you can see. You can actually see the blood thicken, and that thickening is the fibrin that's formed. And so it's very logical that this was the initial protein that really helped um, give rise to everything else that we know about, uh, about blood, blood clotting factors. Everything else that we know came after the discovery of fibrin and fibrinogen. Um, there's a lot of features of fibrinogen that I really appreciate as a researcher. Um, one of them is that it's simply a large protein. It's one of the biggest clotting factors that there is, which gives us a lot of um, places to look in the protein when we're trying to understand how it works. And it's also present in, in normal circumstances in high concentrations in the blood. And in fact, is the highest concentration um, clotting factor. And when you're trying to study something, you have to have a lot of it in order to be able to do these studies. And so that actually makes our studies feasible, something we can do. And then as Dr. Manka Johnson highlighted, it's a complicated protein, a very complex protein. There are six separate protein chains that come together to make one of these molecules. And if I think I can, um, Whoops, uh-oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let me try this again. I thought I was gonna to try to bring up a, no, I thought I was gonna be able to bring up a highlighter. All right, so as Dr. Manko Johnson showed that the, um, the chains are arranged in a really interesting format where one end of every single chain is arranged in the center of the molecule and these chains radiate outward, um, which enables this, um, this protein to interact with things on both ends. It's like a dumbbell and it enables it to have some really interesting functions that are completely different than just about any other protein that we know of. Um, this was also highlighted by um, Dr. Manko Johnson, and this goes into a little bit more detail. Um, it's made in the liver cells. So liver health and liver function is really important in, in um, understanding how fibrinogen is made. Um, because it has this really interesting structure, what ends up happening is that each chain is first made individually. And then after those chains are made, they come together in a really interesting fashion. First, they come together as dimers. So the A alpha and the gamma chain come together and then the B beta and the gamma chain come together. And then the missing chain from each of these heterodimers forms this trimer in which all three chains are together. And then the trimer is assembled into the hexamer finally with everything oriented to the center. And again, that's extremely unique. I don't know of any other protein that does that. And there are investigators that spend their entire careers studying this process and how this arises within um, liver cells. And then after this molecule is synthesized, it um, is secreted from the liver cell into the blood. And of course, in the blood is where most of its functions happen. And this is where we're able to collect it and study it and really um, understand its functions. This is a simplified clotting, clotting cascade from the ones you saw this morning. And I think this highlights all the important stuff that you need to know. 
Um, there's an initiating activity tissue factor here that triggers that cascade of events that you heard about, but ultimately the enzyme that we care about, the thing that's doing the job is thrombin, and thrombin is the enzyme that cuts fibrinogen and converts it, enables it to, to um, form this polymer um, in, that undergoes this interesting conformation that Dr. Manka Johnson presented. And what I love about this molecule being a, a visual person is that we can see this process using really simple microscopes. So in these images, we've been able to capture what this looks like. So this one on the left is an individual fibrinogen. This is an actual protein that we've managed to image. Um, this was actually imaged at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this is that center region. These are the radiating outward regions, the D, domain, D, the D regions. And then there's some extra chain that comes off of this, but it looks very much like we draw it. And then when it begins to polymerize, it assembles in a really tightly packed structure, the way oranges will pack together with these domains. And so you end up with a half staggered conformation and you can see that here in a protofibril in the middle image. And then eventually those protofibrils assemble into a web. Um, and this is a web-like or fish net, um, if you will. And what I love about this is that I can explain to anybody, uh, and I don't even have to explain to anybody, that this does exactly what you think it would do. It traps things. And that is its major function. And once you know that it traps things, it becomes really easy to begin to imagine the kinds of jobs that it has. And when you don't have it, what jobs are not taking place. And it really helps us understand a lot about um, what's going on when this process is not um, occurring the way it's supposed to occur. There are a lot of things that influence the way that process takes place. Some of them are genetic, um, and, and that is where congenital fibrinogen changes and deficiencies come from. But then there can be a lot of ways in which changes in fibrin formation can be acquired. Um, some of them come from the environment. Things like infection or smoking can alter the way the clot forms, and so an abnormal clot can form even in a person with otherwise normal fibrinogen. There are certain medicines that can change the way the fibrin forms and the way fibrinogen functions, including oral contraceptives. That's an example of this here. And then once the fibrinogen is moving through the blood, the blood flow changes the way it forms. If there's no flow or if there is some flow, those fibrin strands form in a very different structure. Um, the way in which thrombin, our, our sort of highlight enzyme forms, can change the way fibrin is, is made. And then, of course, mutations and changes in fibrinogen can change all of this. And so as a researcher, that gives me a lot of different ways to apply what we're learning and, and look at it under a variety of circumstances. Um, one interesting thing about fibrin is, though, is that although we draw this process where an individual fibrinogen forms a net, it's actually even more interesting than that. And we know that th from an experiment in which we can vary how much thrombin is formed um, and what that does to the net. And so what we did is we formed fibrin nets in which we used just a little bit of thrombin or we used a lot of thrombin. And then we imaged this with a microscope. And what we see is the same fibrinogen in every case forms a really different structure depending on how much enzyme is present. So some of the clots are very coarse and open and have very thick fibers. And some of the clots are very dense and have very thin fibers. And it turns out this is critically important. These kinds of clots on the left, these clots with thick fibers are very weak kinds of clots. And we can see these clots if we look at clots from um, individuals with a history of bleeding. And so that can include low fibrinogen levels or can even include things like hemophilia. So those are, they have that much in common that those clots are abnormal. And then if we have very high concentrations of thrombin in these dense networks, these are very strong clots, which is good, but in fact, they're so strong that they can be seen in patients with thrombosis that include things like um, deep vein thrombosis and heart attacks. And so we know that there's a happy, there's a sweet spot, there's a happy medium somewhere in here. And our goal with all of the work that we do is to try to identify what that sweet spot is and how we can help someone with this kind of abnormal clot or this kind of abnormal clot regain normal clotting function um, so that they don't have bleeding or thrombotic disorders. Um, one of the other things that I really love about this molecule is the, the ways in which you can study it. And so this is an interesting experiment that our colleagues in the Department of Physics at UNC did. And what they did is they made a single strand of fibrin and they draped it across a channel. And you can see that illustrated on the left in the cartoon. 
And then they took a microscope that has a pick on it, like a guitar string, like you would pluck a guitar string, and they can stretch that individual fibrin strand quite a bit. And when they stretch it, they can make measurements that show how far it can be stretched without it breaking and how well it can return to that native space after it's stretched. And they can understand more about how fibrin is functioning. And when they did that, they made a kind of startling but really cool observation. And that is that the fibrin fiber can be extended about 300% of its length. I mean, it's extraordinarily extensible. And that is actually even more than a spider silk strand can be extended. And once they made that analogy, it was, it was much easier for me to appreciate um, what a cell might feel when it encounters fibrin in the circulation and how much strength and extensibility a fibrin strand has to be to function normally. And, and we can really put that into, into context by just keeping a spider silk strand in mind, which is something all of us have encountered. I wanna talk about one other thing that um, was also sort of hinted at this morning, and that is that the fibrin itself, once it forms, that isn't the end of the story. It has to be stabilized. And it's stabilized by a protein factor 13, which is actually the, one of the last clotting factors that were described, which is why it has such a high number. And factor 13 is better known as its official name is a transglutaminase. But if you look for it on the internet, what you find is that it's a meat glue. And what does that mean as a meat glue? Well, it's in charge of gluing proteins together. So it happens in clotting and it strengthens fibrin, but it also happens in real life. And this is another thing that we've all been um, familiar with. A, a variation of factor 13, this meat glue, is what's used to hold sort of abnormal cuts of meat together. So if you've had um, any of these culinary gastronomy kinds of meals um, with seafood slices or lamb and scallops, um, or even your run-of-the-mill chicken nuggets, the thing that allows different pieces of meat to stick together and stick to one another is in fact that they have been glued together by an enzyme that is in the same family as factor 13. So in the blood, what factor 13 is then doing is it circulates with fibrinogen. These two proteins are best friends. And it is there because its major role, its dominant role is in fact to stabilize the fibrin and it has to be on the fibrinogen when it becomes fibrin. So it's activated by the same enzyme that fibrinogen is. Nature was very thoughtful in that regard. And it glues the fibrin chains together and it glues some other proteins to fibrin and all of that is very important for stabilizing the fibrin, um, preventing its breakdown and mechanically strengthening that fibrin, making it more able to not be broken when it's stretched. And that makes it really um, important and these two proteins go hand in hand. Um, what that protein process looks like in our clotting cascade is simply right here at the end. So again, remember the thrombin is converting fibrinogen to fibrin, and at that same time, factor 13 is getting activated to factor 13A. The A just means activated form, and it forms all these crosslinks, which holds all of this together and ensures that the fibrin that's formed is, um, has the right integrity that can hold together and do all of its jobs. Um, you heard a little bit about fibrinogen abnormalities, and this is a whole um, string of different ways in which this process can go wrong with a fibrinogenemia, but also low levels, abnormal levels, abnormal levels of or low levels of abnormal fibrinogen. Um, and, and these present with really different kinds of symptoms. Um, what we know is that fibrinogen levels don't necessarily correlate with the mutation that's been identified or with laboratory measurements. And that even two people that have the exact same uh, mutation might have a very different um, clinical course, might have very different symptoms. And so the premise that we work under in the research lab then is that if we just, if we, it's hard to study what's not there, but if we study what is there, if we study fibrinogen and we can understand fibrinogen and fibrin functions, maybe we can explain the different symptoms that are seen in fibrinogen deficiency in a fibrinogenemia and then we know exactly how to fix the problem. And we won't be applying a lot of different kinds of things anymore. We can fix exactly what's going on and exactly what's wrong. And that would optimize the treatment and make it better and make it safer. And that's what we'd ultimately like to do. So if we start thinking about what the fibrinogen is doing, fibrinogen and fibrin, so we abbreviate fibrinogen, um, it has many roles. It is a mesh, it's, a, it's that net, and it stabilizes the clots, and we've seen that already. Um, it also can mediate interactions between other things, and again, that's partly because of the two, um, so the dumbbell structure of it, it can bridge molecules. 
And so it can bridge cells in the blood and it can bridge things like the clot to the blood vessels and proteins within the blood vessels. And then it can also connect things. So it can localize proteins that are in the blood to the clot. And that's important for getting those clots to heal properly. And fibrinogen and fibrin have this function and they participate, um, both of these kinds of forms of the molecule participate in all of these um, uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, as a result of its many jobs, fibrinogen is important not only in clotting, but in a lot of circumstances. And we're highlighting some of these here. Obviously we know it's important um, and has a role in bleeding as well as thrombosis, and this illustrates deep vein thrombosis. And it's important for wound healing and has a role in stroke. And then it also has roles in maybe less common um, things that you may not think about as much, but it's critical for um, protecting us against infection. It has a role in obesity. It has a role in cancer. It even has roles in Alzheimer's disease and other um, situations. And so our studies venture into all of these different kinds of settings because we think it's gonna provide us with clues as to what fibrinogen is doing. And if it's not there and we replace it, what kinds of effects might that have? How might it protect against diseases? How could it contribute to diseases? And, and what we're doing and what we're trying to understand about that process. Clearly though, its major function is in bleeding and thrombosis. And so these are the two settings in which we spend most of our time. And what I'm really gonna do is I'm gonna talk more about its role in clotting, again, to try to understand when it causes clots, what it's doing and how we've gone about figuring that out and discovering something new in the last few years um, that we think are, is pretty interesting and we're trying to learn more about it. Um, so to talk just a little bit about um, this particular setting in which we're looking at fibrinogen, we're looking at venous thrombosis, which is a major public health concern. It affects about one or two in every 1,000 people each year, and that's true in the U.S. and it's true in Europe. And with people older than age 55, it's actually about one in 100. So it's actually a, quite common and associated uh, and seen in, in individuals that even have normal fibrinogen levels. So it's something with widespread interest. What happens is that these clots form in the deep veins and they can travel to the lungs and there's a variety of symptoms including leg pain and swelling. Um, it can lead to these lung problems that Dr. Micah Johnson highlighted and, and it can lead to death and we've um, indicated two individuals here that are currently experiencing um, deep vein thrombosis in these images and as a result every major organization in the field um, is really trying to prioritize this level of research. And I'm excited about that, that it's being recognized and prioritized. And that includes the American Heart Association, the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, the American Society of Hematology, and of course, Haney, um, looking at all of these um, settings. Um, one thing that you may have heard or seen in the news that was surprising to all of us and something we've learned literally since March is that these kinds of clots seem to appear in patients that have COVID-19. And so we've been studying that and it's providing us with additional clues about ways in which fibrinogen is participating in this process. It was entirely unexpected, but we're using this to try to understand more about what's going on. So the reason in particular that we're interested in venous thrombosis is that when we look at one of these clots, we can take it out of a person and we can put it in a microscope and we can see that that clot is uh, composed of two major things. Um, one, there are red cells here and these are these strange shapes. And um, the second thing is fibrin and we see this material here, this sort of dotted material and it's like as if fibrin strands were cut in cross section, almost as if you take a bowl of spaghetti and just cut it in half and you see some of it in cross section and some of it in longer streaks. The red cells have a really strange shape here and I hopefully you've noticed that. Um, if you've seen red cells in the past and most of us have, they have this sort of donut shape or if you're in New York, a Bialy shape, I think. Um, and they lose that shape in a clot. And it tells us that what happens in this clot is that contractile force where the clot consolidates. And that's uh, important for drawing the edges of a wound together and it's important for the wound healing process. And it turns out it doesn't just happen when you have an injury um, to the outside of the vessel, but it happens within the blood vessel as well and can be very problematic because it makes this clot very dense and very difficult to break up 
But we see it here, which gives us a major clue about what's going on, and that is that there's this consolidation process that brings the fibrin and the red cells um, very close together. And we've wondered for a long time if that tells us something about the way these clots form and tells us something about what fibrin may be doing when, it, when it's inside these clots. So we did an experiment a few years ago just to try to discover what may be taking place. Mm -hmm. And the experiment is very simple. And in some way, every one of us has done this at some point in our own homes. And that is to basically take blood and let it clot. And when it clots, it forms a clot that undergoes consolidation or contraction. And what you end up with is something in a tube that looks like this. So the fibrin and all the blood cells are inside the clot here. And the serum, that is everything that isn't part of the clot, comes out and this is this yellow material here and when we did this we did it in um, blood that doesn't have factor 13 so there was fibrin but there wasn't factor 13 and what we saw was just amazing it was completely unexpected if there's factor 13 present the clot is cross-linked um, like i described earlier and you end up with a clot and it contains all of the cells and here's the serum everything that isn't part of that clot and a few little red blood cells here come out on the bottom. But when we do this in a clot that in which there isn't uh, factor 13, so there's no fibrin cross-linking, the clot was dramatically smaller. And the reason it was smaller is because all the red cells literally fell out of the clot and landed in a pool in the bottom of the tube. And to this day, it's one of the most striking things I've seen as a researcher. Um, I wanted to bring up this quote because this is really central to understanding how a researcher spends our day. Um, we don't often discover things that we intended to discover. We often find things because we really didn't anticipate what was going on. Um, and so this quote really summarizes how we, we spend most of our time is, is trying to figure out what it is that we don't know. So in this case, how did we figure out what's going on? Well, we, we could image things here like we did on the left, but we wanted to take a closer look at that. And I'm gonna show you a couple of videos um, in which we tried to really see what was going on. So the video on the left is a clot and it contains all the cells and all the fibrin and all the material that a clot has and it's contracting and you can see it literally contracting. The clot on the right is one in which we prevented the fibrin from being cross-linked and what you see is the clot is still contracting, but those red cells, those donut shaped cells are literally coming out of the clot. They're not trapped within the clot. And when we saw this, we realized we were onto something. What we had seen in those test tubes is really taking place. And there's something interesting about the way fibrin normally keeps red cells in. And if it's not cross-linked, it can't do that. And I'm gonna show you one more video that I think captures this even better. Here we took blood and we stained the fibrin in a green. Um, fluorescence and we stain the red blood cells in a red fluorescence and you can see here how the clot is contracting and it's all moving off the screen there and the red cells are all contained within that clot but if we do the same thing on the right you can see that the force of that clot contracting is actually squeezing out the red cells like you would wring out a sponge so something about the fibrin when it's not cross-linked was allowing those red blood cells to escape and that's why those clots were ending up so small so after staring at these images for a while, we began coming up with hypotheses. The first is that we thought, well, maybe the red cells are getting literally glued to the fibrin, and that kind of made a lot of sense to us. But we did experiments and realized we were actually completely wrong. Um, the red cells are not glued to the fibrin, and no other proteins were necessary. So even though factor 13 can glue other proteins to fibrin, that also wasn't enough to explain what was going on. And we eventually began to realize that, well, just like we knew from the beginning, fibrin is a net. Maybe that net was trapping the red cells. And so we've gone in and done a number of experiments in which we show that if the fibrin net gets denser, remember like when we have high thrombin and we get that very dense network, it traps more red cells. And the cross-linking can further enhance that process. So it makes that net stronger and it makes that net better. And we think that's why it's able to trap more red cells. So we kind of return to this image and we've spent a lot more time thinking about this and understanding what's going on. Turns out that cross-linking increases the stiffness of that fibrin. It not only makes it stronger, but it makes it stiffer so that when the clot is contracting and the red cells are getting squeezed out, they literally can't escape anymore because the fibrin fiber, that net is so stiff. 
um, which gives us a whole different appreciation of what that net is doing and how it's keeping the clot together and how it's keeping all those cells in the clot and enabling wound healing to take place. So we like to draw and like to cartoon out what we think is going on as we're generating our hypotheses. And this is currently what we think is going on. Um, we think that there, when normal blood clot, when, when, when clot formation normally starts, it forms a clot and that green material, that fibrin traps all of the cells that are present. It traps leukocytes, it traps platelets, it traps red cells. And that is a clot that would form under a normal circumstance. If something happens where there's more fibrin, if the fibrin is denser, if it's stiffer than it should be, if there's a mutation in the fibrinogen that makes the fibrin stiffer, we think what happens then is it traps more red cells in the clot. And so it makes these very large clots and those large clots are prone to blocking blood flow and causing thrombosis and not, not really functioning in the way we want a clot to function. And then on the other side, if the clot is weak, that is if there's not enough fibrinogen to really form that net, or there's a mutation in the fibrinogen that makes it not able to form the net, or it can't be cross-linked, then as that clot is contracting, the red cells get squeezed out. And what you end up with is a small clot, or maybe even no clot, and that may lead to an increased risk of bleeding. And so again, maybe just like we surmised early on, if we can alter this process, maybe there's a sweet spot in the middle where we can really take somebody who has an abnormal clot on one side or the other and convert it into a normal clot. So that leads us to a line of study where we're trying to identify a molecule, a drug that we may be able to use that's different from anything that's currently on the market that may be safer or we may be able to use with fibrinogen that can make that a safer um, product and a safer treatment. So I'm gonna talk about kind of a strange and crazy idea that we've had and we've been exploring it. And I think, it's, I think it might work and, and we're just at the early stages. So there's, there's no promises here, uh, but we're taking a creative approach um, to try to understand this and, and science and research really involve a lot of creativity to come up with something that we just don't know about and just try things. And in this case, prepare yourself. We're looking at a leech. Um, this is in fact a giant Amazon leech um, and it is really giant. It's um, about four inches wide and about 18 inches long. You can appreciate that from this image. It has a two and a half inch feeding tube that enables it to um, live um, because these leeches, I think we all know, are hemivores, meaning they love blood. And they feed on, in this case, very large animals, so alligators and, and large snakes. And in order to have that blood meal, they have to be able to maintain the blood in a fluid state. They can't let the blood clot or they won't be able to eat. And so they make enzymes that dissolve fibrin. And it turns out they also make an enzyme that can inhibit the fibrin cross-linking, which makes the fibrin weaker, which makes that easier to dissolve. And so it ensures that they can get their blood meal. And so we're isolating a protein called tritogen um, that we think may be able to do this and have promise in being able to change the way the fibrin is cross-linked. Um, and our early studies suggest that we can form clots in tubes, and these are clots formed from um, healthy human volunteers. Um, and we've been able to look at these, and when we add this tritogen protein to prevent the clot cross-linking, we can make these large clots become smaller clots. So we're continuing to pursue this. Um, but, and we're doing a lot of studies and it's kind of interesting and it's very strange, um, but we think we may be able to learn a lot from taking this kind of in a creative approach to what it is that we're doing. So that's kind of summarizes what we're doing, what we know and how we're trying to learn more. Um, these are things that I think everybody on this Zoom knows, um, but I'll summarize again that fibrinogen is a large protein and it has a lot of functions, which gives it a lot of interest for researchers. And because the fibrinogen deficiency or abnormalities can lead to bleeding and thrombosis and other disorders, there's a lot of places for us to study. And so we continue to operate under this idea that if we can understand fibrinogen and fibrin, we can develop better ways to diagnose fibrinogen abnormalities. And we can also um, develop improved treatments that can be applied to both bleeding and clotting and in a way that I think is more personalized and targeted and helpful and maybe safer. So the final thing that I'll say here is that to do this work, um, we're in a lab in Chapel Hill, um, but we have a lot of collaborators 
person that we've interacted with because each researcher comes in with specialty. And to do these studies, we have to have a lot of um, special tools and special expertise. And so you can see that um, on the left are people that have come through my lab, um, some for their PhD training and some for undergraduate training. And then on the right, what you see is um, national and international collaborators that we've turned to that have been really helpful in, in, in helping us do these studies and, and are continuing to work with us. Um, so I'll thank you very much and close with this picture, which is one of my favorite ones of, of blood clotting because it highlights not only the red cells, but, but fibrin, our favorite molecule here, um, and really helps us understand what's going on. Um, again, I'll thank the Hemophilia Association of New York. And this final button is to remind me to thank um, two people in particular that I won't identify in this talk, but the studies that I've described today in our discovery of how fibrin nets trap these red blood cells um, came about in part because of two patients, um, one that had fibrinogen deficiency and one that had factor 13 deficiency that donated blood for our studies and enabled us to do some testing and understand more about what's taking place. And so I'm very grateful for the connections that we've had through the physicians to patients and their willingness to help us um, uh, do these studies and advance what it is that we know.